Rupert's Land, or Prince Rupert's Land, was a territory in British North America comprising the Hudson Bay Drainage Basin, a territory in which a commercial monopoly was operated by the Hudson's Bay Company for 200 years from 1670 to 1870. The area once known as Rupert's Land is now mainly a part of Canada, but a small portion is now in the United States of America. It was named after Prince Rupert of the Rhine, a nephew of Charles I and the first governor of the Hudson's Bay Company HBC. In December 1821, the HBC monopoly was extended from Rupert's Land to the Pacific coast. Areas belonging to Rupert's Land were mostly in present-day Canada and included the whole of Manitoba, most of Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, southern Nunavut, and northern parts of Ontario and Quebec. It also included present-day United States territory, including parts of the states of Minnesota and North Dakota and very small parts of Montana and South Dakota. The southern border west of Lake of the Woods to the Rocky Mountains was the drainage divide between the Mississippi and Saskatchewan watersheds until the London Convention of 1818 substituted the 49th parallel. <laughs> Hudson's Bay Company's claim of ownership When granted the English Royal Charter in 1670 by King Charles II of England, the Hudson's Bay Company, under the governorship of the king's cousin Prince Rupert of the Rhine, was granted the sole trade and commerce of all those seas, straits, bays, rivers, lakes, creeks, and sounds, in whatsoever latitude they shall be, that lie within the entrance of the straits commonly called Hudson Straits, together with all the lands, countries and territories, upon the coasts and confines of the seas, straits, bays, lakes, rivers, creeks and sounds, aforesaid, which are not now actually possessed by any of our subjects, or by the subjects of any other Christian prince or state, and that the said land be from henceforth reckoned and reputed as one of our plantations or colonies in America, called Rupert's Land. The Royal Charter made the Governor and Company, and their successors, the true and absolute lords and proprietors, of the same territory, limits and places aforesaid, and of all other the premises sick, and granted them the authority to erect and build such castles, fortifications, forts, garrisons, colonies or plantations, towns or villages, in any parts or places within the limits and bounds granted before in these presents, unto the said Governor and Company, as they in their discretion shall think fit and requisite, following merger with the North West Company in 1821, the Hudson's Bay Company's monopoly privileges and license were extended to trade over the Northwestern Territory. The Rupert's Land Act 1868 of the United Kingdom Parliament authorized the sale of Rupert's Land to Canada with the understanding that Rupert's Land shall include the whole of the lands and territories held or claimed to be held by the Hudson's Bay Company. The prevailing attitude of the time was that Rupert's Land was owned by the Hudson's Bay Company because from the beginning to the end, the Hudson's Bay Company had always claimed up to the parallel 49, and argued that the Royal Charter and various Acts of Parliament granted them all the regions under British dominion watered by streams flowing into Hudson Bay. Rupert's Land had been essentially a private continental estate cover 3.9 million square kilometres in the heart of North America that stretched from the Atlantic to the Rocky Mountains, and from the prairies to the Arctic Circle. Even Sir John A. Macdonald saw the land as being sold to Canada. No explanation has been made of the arrangement by which the country Rupert's land is handed over to the Queen, and that it is Her Majesty who transfers the country to Canada with the same rights to settlers as existed before. All these poor people know is that Canada has bought the country from the Hudson's Bay Company, and that they are handed over like a flock of sheep to us. However, this did not settle the issue of Aboriginal title over the land. At the time the Royal Charter was granted in 1670, the Crown did not have the authority to give jurisdiction of sovereignty over the territory already settled and inhabited by the indigenous people of North America. The Royal Charter ignored the First Nations who were already living on the land and exercising sovereignty over it, and the Hudson's Bay Company had not acquired title to the land from the Aboriginal communities prior to their negotiations with Canada that began in 1856. Due to the Royal Charter and the later Rupert's Land Act 1868, the Crown held the attitude that they already possessed the land, and that the treaties were a peaceful way to allow for settlement of the Northwest Territories in lands the Crown already owned. While the First Nations understood the treaties to be between nations to share the land, ownership of the land was not a concept in First Nations cultures, the Crown saw them as a way to ensure sovereignty over the land from a people who only had sovereignty as a personal and usufructuary right, dependent upon the goodwill of the sovereign." In the Royal Proclamation of 1763, 
at the time of the discovery of America, and long after, it was an accepted rule that heathen and infidel nations were perpetual enemies, and that the Christian prince or people first discovering and taking possession of the country became its absolute proprietor, and could deal with the lands as such." The Calder v. British Columbia case in 1973 was the first case in Canadian law that acknowledged a declaration that the Aboriginal title, otherwise known as the Indian title, of the plaintiffs to their ancient tribal territory hereinbefore described, has never been lawfully extinguished. This ruling has led to more Aboriginal land claim negotiations, and overhauled much of the process of addressing Aboriginal title to land that existed prior to colonization and confederation, and whether that title had been extinguished. Fur trade. In 1670, the Hudson's Bay Company HBC was granted a charter by King Charles II, giving it a trading monopoly over the watershed of all rivers and streams flowing into Hudson Bay, an area known as Rupert's Land, named in honor of Prince Rupert of the Rhine, the king's cousin and the company's first governor. This covered an area of 3.9 million square kilometers, 1.5 million square miles, over one third the area of Canada today. The Hudson's Bay Company dominated trade in Rupert's land during the 18th–19th centuries and drew on the local population for many of its employees. This necessarily meant the hiring of many First Nations and Métis workers. Fuchs 2002 discusses the activities of these workers and the changing attitudes that the company had toward them. George Simpson, one of the most noted company administrators, held a particularly dim view of mixed-blood workers and kept them from attaining positions in the company higher than postmaster. Later administrators, such as James Anderson and Donald Ross, sought avenues for the advancement of indigenous employees. Morton 1962 reviews the pressures at work on that part of Rupert's land where Winnipeg now stands, a decade before its incorporation into Canada. It was a region completely given over to the fur trade, divided between the Hudson's Bay Company and private traders, with some incursions by the rival North West Company based in Montreal. There was strong business and political agitation in Upper Canada for annexing the territory. In London, the company's trading license was due for review. In St. Paul, there was a growing interest in the area as a field for U.S. expansion. The Great Commercial Depression of 1857 dampened most of the outside interests in the territory, which itself remained comparatively prosperous. <laughs> Law Before 1835, the Hudson's Bay Company had no formal legal system in Rupert's land, creating «courts» on an ad hoc basis. The Hudson's Bay Company's «laws» In the 17th century and 18th centuries had been the regulations settling out the rules governing the relationships between various employees in the company's posts in Rupert's Land and to interact with the native peoples. The 1670 charter granting the company control of Rupert's Land had said trials were to conducted by the governor of Rupert's Land together with three of his councillors. There were only three cases before the 19th century with the one with the most detailed notes being the trial of one Thomas Butler in 1715 at the York factory who was convicted of theft, slander and fornication with a native woman. In the early 19th century, the HBC had waged a violent struggle with the rival North West Company based in Montreal for the control of the fur trade culminating in the Seven Oaks Massacre of 1816, which led to an investigation by the House of Commons, and which in turn led to the Second Canada Jurisdiction Act of 1821, ordering the Hudson's Bay Company to establish justice of the peace in Rupert's land. Instead of establishing courts, the company directed the governor and the Council of Assiniboia to mediate disputes as they arose. In 1839, the Hudson's Bay Company were convinced of the need to dispense formal justice throughout Rupert's land and established a court at the Red River Colony, in the district of Assiniboia, south of Lake Winnipeg. A recorder and president of the court would act as legal organizer, advisor, magistrate, and counselor and be responsible for the rationalization and formalization of Rupert's land's judicial system. The first recorder was Adam Tom, who held the post until 1854, although relieved of most of his duties by his deputy some years before. He was succeeded as president of the court from 1862 to 1870 by John Black. Baker 1999 uses the Red River Colony, the only non-native settlement on the Northwest Prairies for most of the 19th century, as a site for critical exploration of the meaning of law and order. 
on the Canadian frontier and for an investigation of the sources from which legal history might be rewritten as the history of legal culture. Previous historians have assumed that the Hudson's Bay Company's representatives designed and implemented a local legal system dedicated instrumentally to the protection of the company's fur trade monopoly and, more generally, to strict control of settlement life in the company's interests. But this view is not borne out by archival research. Examination of Assiniboia's juridical institutions in action reveals a history formed less through the imposition of authority from above than by obtaining support from below. Baker shows that the legal history of the Red River Colony, and, by extension, of the Canadian West in general, is based on English common law. Following the forced merger of the North West Company with the HBC in 1821, British Parliament applied the laws of Upper Canada to Rupert's Land and the Columbia District and gave enforcement power to the HBC. The Hudson's Bay Company maintained peace in Rupert's land for the benefit of the fur trade. The Plains Indians had achieved a rough balance of power among themselves. The organization of the Metis provided internal security and a degree of external protection. This stable order broke down in the 1860s with the decline of the Hudson's Bay Company, smallpox epidemics, and the arrival of American whiskey traders on the Great Plains, and the disappearance of the bison. The rule of law was, after the purchase of Rupert's land by Canada, enforced by the Northwest Mounted Police. Missions Peak describes people, places, and activities that were involved in 19th-century Anglican missionary activities in the prairie areas of Rupert's land, that huge portion of Canada controlled by the Hudson's Bay Company and inhabited by few Europeans. Early in the century, fur trade competition forced the company to expand into this interior region, and some officials saw advantages in allowing missionaries to accompany them. Officially they did not discriminate among denominations, but preference was often granted to the Anglicans of the Britain-based Church Missionary Society. The prairie missions extended from the area of 20th century Winnipeg to the Mackenzie River Delta in the north. Notable missionaries included R.E.V.D. John West, the first Protestant missionary to come to the area in 1820, David Anderson the first Bishop of Rupert's Land, the inept William Bompas and the Native American Anglican priests, Henry Budd, James Sette and Robert MacDonald, there were also Roman Catholic missions in Rupert's Land. One notable missionary was Alexander Antonin Taché, who both before and after his consecration as bishop worked as a missionary in St. Boniface, Ile à la Crosse, Fort Chippewyan and Fort Smith. Topic. Hudson's Bay Company's surrender of its charter to the Crown In 1869 1870, the Hudson's Bay Company surrendered its charter to the British Crown, receiving £300,000 in compensation. While it is often said that Hudson's Bay sold Rupert's land as well as the Northwestern Territory, the company had no land to sell, its charter was essentially for a trading monopoly enforceable on British subjects. Control was originally planned to be transferred on 1 December 1869, but due to the premature action of the new lieutenant governor, William McDougall, the people of Red River formed a provisional government that took control until arrangements could be negotiated by leaders of what is known as the Red River Resistance and the newly formed Government of Canada. As a result of the negotiations, Canada asserted control on July 15, 1870. However, Canada still did not have legal control because the Imperial Crown had made the transfer subject to treaties being entered into with the Indigenous nations. While Canada did pass legislation on May 12, 1870 purporting to create the province of Manitoba, the absence of the treaties was soon noted, and it was decided in 1873 to pass a second Manitoba Act which would have legal certainty. Other numbered treaties followed, and treaty-making extended to the Northwestern Territory, which comprised the regions northwest of Rupert's Land and to the north of the colony of British Columbia. The transaction was three-cornered. On 19 November 1869, the company surrendered its charter under its letters patent to the British Crown, which was authorized to accept the surrender by the Rupert's Land Act. By order in council dated June 23, 1870, the British government admitted the territory to Canada, under S. 
146 of the Constitution Act, 1867, effective July 15, 1870, subject to the making of treaties with the sovereign indigenous nations to provide their consent to the Imperial Crown to exercise its sovereignty pursuant to the limitations and conditions of the Rupert's Land documents and the treaties. Lastly, the Government of Canada compensated the Hudson's Bay Company £300,000 for the surrender of its charter on the terms set out in the order in council. The company retained its most successful trading posts and one twentieth of the land surveyed for immigration and settlement. See also 49th Parallel North British Arctic Territories Canadian Canoe Routes Former Colonies and Territories in Canada Hudson's Bay Company Archives Royal Eponyms in Canada References This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Morris, Adrian Gabriel 1912. Alexander Antonin Taché. In Herbermann, Charles. Catholic Encyclopedia, 14. New York, Robert Appleton. Topic. Further reading Topic. External links The Centre for Rupert's Land Studies, the University of Winnipeg. Canada Buys Rupert's Land. CBC